I think the movement is to help women and men get beyond the things that are holding us back from treating ourselves with love, honor, and respect so that we can not only have happy, fulfilled lives, but we can offer more service to the world, that we can, we can bring more happiness, love, and respect to each other. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Emily Leadership Podcast, where we talk about a variety of interesting topics, relationships, career, well-being, and personal growth. Today, I have Maria Lepuma in the house. Hi, Maria. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Emily. It's great to see you and be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I know you love your job being a body confidence coach, and you've been helping women overcome challenges in the areas of eating disorder, low self-esteem, and body image since 2005. Mm -hmm. So how has the health and wellness industry changed over the years? Yes. So thank you, Emily. And yes, it's actually been since 2005. You know, it's interesting because um, the way, the nature of my work and the way I help my clients and students has not really been typical in the, in the health industry. I mean, it's, it's available, but, you know, people think of health and wellness, they think of diet and exercise, which is all wonderful stuff. But I typically work from the inside out with people that are struggling. They know what to do, but they can't do it. They have deeper reasons that are keeping them in, in self-sabotaging behaviors. And, and so I help those women and sometimes men. I do work with men as well, although I focus on working with women um, to just release the, the, inner, the inner blocks that keep them stuck. And so I do think that the health industry has changed over the years in the understanding that, that, that their you know, mindset is essential, of course, and also that if there are problems in you being able to follow through with your health and fitness goals or any kind of areas around improving your body confidence, that there, there are deeper reasons why you're being stuck. And I really emphasize it's not because there's something wrong with me, you, there's not because you're unusual, because I think that one of the things that the, unfortunately, the diet mentality has created in this country is this feeling like, well, if I'm not successful on this diet, then, then there's something wrong with me or there's something wrong with my body. And there's definitely absolutely one size fits all is not the case. We all have very unique bodies. We all have very unique needs. And at different points in our life, the same body can have different needs. So yes, there's wonderful information out there. There's great science. There's great authority that can give us information. But we also have to start learning to listen to ourselves and to trust our body and to learn what's right for us. So I do believe that coming into more alignment with yourself, with your body, listening to your body, if something's not working for you, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. Maybe it's another approach that you need to take. Or maybe you can take a little from here and take a little from here and then create something that will work for you. Many years ago, I, I worked in an eating disorder unit, and uh, I, I've actually healed from multiple eating disorders myself. For my purpose, really comes out of my own pain. Um, and it was apparent that most people have eating disorders because there, there's a there's some trauma there, you know, mm -hmm. and that uh, especially, I mean, it happens with boys as well, but with women, either you're severely underweight or you're very overweight. There's usually issues around your body. There's usually issues around your sexuality. I mean, there's so many different things that go into this. So the thing is, though, that just trying to go on a diet to get to a healthy weight is not going to solve all those deeper drivers that are keeping you stuck. And the, you can absolutely heal from this, but it's, but it's a deeper approach to healing 
And you can, I mean, I am proof of it, that you can have peace with food, you can have peace with your body, you can maintain a healthy weight. And it took me many years to get here, but I had the one thing I, I feel blessed that I had all along the way is I felt that, because, you know, if you're struggling with addictive behaviors, um, emotional eating, binge eating, compulsive eating, any of those, or, or obsessive dieting or body image issues, there, there's a lot of emotional hell that goes along with it. And there was a, something in me that felt like, you know what? The creator didn't create us to, to live in this much hell. There has to be a solution to this. And that's what really informed me turning over everything to not only find my own freedom, but along the way, as I started coaching around 2005, when I started teaching yoga, that that everything I learn, I, I naturally offer to help my students and clients. What are some of the main components that you look at when you are helping with a client who, for example, who's going through eating disorder? And what will be the framework or holistic approach that you use to make sure that, you know, we cover all the main areas? Yes, yes. Well, you know, every person is unique and every person has their own particular most pressing issue around this. But really at the core of a lot of it is stress and stress management. Mm. So I do an extensive intake with my clients to, to identify exactly what areas of their life they're struggling with, particularly around this. And sometimes it's not always around this, you know, like years ago, I had a client who felt like she just needed to lose some weight. And, and then in the same breath, she said, and then I'll start dating. But the reality of it was that we needed to address her intimacy issues. It wasn't about the weight. I mean, she may have had a few pounds to lose, but it was more that she was sabotaging her weight loss because she was too afraid to start dating because she was still reeling from a breakup in a previous relationship. So that's why it's very unique to people because a lot of times we have deeper motives that keep us stuck in, in behaviors. So that being said, I do, uh, I typically have a consultation, a free consultation with anybody that I'm going to work with to make sure that um, there's, there's rapport to make sure that um, they feel comfortable with me and that I can feel confident that I can help them. Um, if not, I can refer them if, if I have someone in my referral. However, I think that, that that's essential because this is a very intimate topic and th there's a safety issue. And I think that from onset, you have to feel safe with anybody that's holding space for you to, to, to do some deep healing. Um, and then I have an extensive intake, but from the onset, I really start teaching them stress, stress management techniques. One of them, of course, is emotional freedom techniques, tapping, which is a wonderful um, technique that will um, start to eliminate stress in your body, physical stress, emotional stress. And there's been a lot of research the last few years around how emotional freedom techniques Tapping, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's a meridian-based therapy that has been very, very effective with trauma, with post-traumatic stress disorder. And now um, there's a researcher um, in Australia, Peter Stapleton, who's done a lot of research with food issues, with um, food addiction. And, and there's even MRI brain scans now to show that what what happens is when we when we have an addictive craving there's parts of the brain that actually light up and so it's beyond willpower there's a physiological response that our body has gotten gotten accustomed to or cultivated over the years um and with applying tapping regularly i think it was just one or two hours a week even that you could see in brain sc scans that those when presented with the food that in the past triggered the, those parts of the brain that lit up, they stopped lighting up. So it's not only that, I mean, I see this magic all the time with my clients. It's not only that it clears it up, but we have evidence now that it's actually changing the brain, which is pretty cool. 
mental health is such a big topic right now. How can they explore in this space to make sure they can find the strategy, find the tool that works well for them, so that they can regulate their emotions on a regular basis? Yes, yes. So that's a great question because I'm a big believer now more than ever. It's essential to to find ways and make the time to regulate your emotions because. The world is getting stressed, more and more stressed. The energy, the vibration,、um, and it's easy to get just caught up in all of that and lose ourselves. And stress is not only—I mean, stress is really the underlying reason for so many problems: inflammation in the body, physical problems, emotional problems, depression, anxiety. And we're in a crisis in this country with our with our mental illness and. And suicide rates are up, and domestic violence is up, and it's it's all stress related, really. And so we're, you know, we're we're living from the outside in. We're not finding our center, and coming from a place of peacefulness. And as much as we want peace, peace begins with each of us individually. Not, you know, we can't go out there and and get frustrated or angry enough. To, about this life circumstances to bring peace, right? So I believe that we all have to take responsibility for finding our peace, finding our center, and learning how to self-regulate. It's not very hard to activate the parasympathetic response in the body. That's the relaxation, the rest and digest response. Actually, just simple breath will do it. Breathing in into your abdomen. Letting go of the breath, taking time to breathe every day. I've worked with clients that you know they they forgot to breathe. You know, I was one of those people many years ago. Oh, we hold our breath, or sometimes when you're sleeping, you hold your breath. Or so it's just it's not beating yourself up or judging yourself. It's just these are patterns, habitual patterns that we've picked up along the way, and we can change them. Though it takes intention to change them. But I'm a big believer in cultivating time every single day to start to practice some mindfulness, some breath, some centering, and it could be a practice like emotional freedom techniques, or it could be other things. You know, movement is great. Movement is medicine. Dancing, flow, not not you know. Hitting the gym, trying to beat yourself up so much. The gym is great if you're doing it to honor your body, but not to sort of beat yourself into submission. The intention is all, all of it, you know. So, I think that now more than ever, it's really important to manage our stress, and I think it's important also for us to realize how damaging stress is for us, because that's going to give us the why. You know, I was just with a client earlier today, and he's been working with me because he's been having difficulty concentrating and memory, and he's trying to figure out how he can do this in his life daily. You know, and I give him videos and I give him stuff that he can work on, and he's still grappling with creating space in his day to to put that in. And it's not uncommon. I think that you know it's easy for us to get up and and feed the dogs and take care of the children and. And and the women in particular, but men too, put other people's needs ahead of ours. But then, if we're stressed out, we it, we end up hurting the people close to us anyway. Because usually, the things that we regret, the things we've said or done in our life, if we really think about it, it was really the outcome of some kind of stress and overwhelm. You know, so managing the stress will not only help your body. To feel better, but our, we have amazing bodies, and our bodies, once they're regulated, have can actually heal. They can self heal in so many ways. When we take out all of the stress, and and I know it's not, you know, I'm saying stress, but it could be years of trauma too, which is stressful, right? We're holding that, but we can start at any point to change that. By taking time every day, I tell my clients set a timer: ten minutes in the morning, ten minutes at night. Do a little breathing, do a little stretching. I like to encourage them to do a little tapping also because it calms down the brain, it calms down the body. Because just like we're our brain and body's in the habit of the stress response, we can actually 
cultivate the habit of the relaxation response. Repetition is the key. We know neuroplasticity, repetition is the key. So it's setting an intention. If 10 minutes is too much, start with five minutes. But valuing yourself enough, and if you don't value yourself enough, because I know a lot of times we don't, do it for the people that you love. Because if you're a parent and you're stressed out, no matter how much you get done for your kids, it's not going to be, you're not going to be giving them you, the essence of you, the best of you by far, right? So you want to be more intentional in all areas of your life. And, um, and from that place of finding your center and, and addressing your, your stress, you can start to be more in alignment, more flow. Your body will thank you. You will bring into your life more flow, I believe, you know, energy. Um, when, we're, when we're stressed and tight, we just bring more stress and tightness into our body. When we're at ease, we bring more flow. And then, of course, if you have experiences in your life that have been traumatic or that, yes, tapping, dancing, movement, any kind of somatic thing is going to help to de-stress and it's great for trauma, but you want to get professional help if you have some deeper issues, because it's like, you know, I'm a practitioner of many like mindfulness and EFT and all kinds of energy. If you look at my resume, it's, it's quite long because like I said, I turned over every leaf to figure this out. And I use a variety of things with my clients, but I mean, I, I from time and time again, get coaching, get mentoring, get help. Because it's like a dentist doesn't perform root canal on themselves, right? You give yourself the gift of getting support from, from a professional. Because especially if you're in physical pain, emotional pain, or struggling the aftermath of some traumatic experience in your life, that you don't have to live that way. That there are lots of, and it doesn't even have to be a painful experience to heal that. It can be a very organic, loving experience that can heal that. I'm a big believer in do no harm and that through love, through compassion, through acceptance, that's the healing medicine. You know, So if you're stuck in even self-defeating behaviors around food, binge eating, numbing yourself, I did that for years. I numbed myself with food. And in hindsight, I think because of my traumatic childhood, it, it kept me safe. But eventually it, it hurts you, you know, because when you numb yourself in one area, you numb yourself to, to the joy and the happiness and the freedom, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's so great. I love what you're saying about bringing in the love and self-compassion as the main driver right behind all of this and i think that's so important like today i listened to tom bill you he talks about the ultimate success is not money the ultimate success is fulfillment right but then how to get to all of the greatest thing that you want to accomplish is because the the foundation like the self-worth right the the fundamental piece like you know just take care of yourself, right? I think that's so critical because I feel you're right. A lot of people, they love to spend time with other people. They love to like feel loved by getting that from other people. But at the same time, they don't carve out enough time to regulate their emotions, to take care of their own needs. Like, okay, wow, I need to really learn how to take care of my own needs in order to do more for my family for my community so yeah so i'm so grateful that you shared that with my audience because i think it's just so critical right to get to in order to get to the other side of it it's the foundation you have to build the foundation first absolutely and i think that um we're not always taught in that in this culture i mean i certainly wasn't brought up in a lineage of women that felt like it was okay to take care of themselves and listen, I get a lot of gratification from, from helping others and from, from giving and from doing. But if you're giving from an empty well, if you're giving from an empty bucket, then you really have nothing to give. And so 
taking care of yourself. I believe that we've been given these bodies there as gifts and that our first and foremost responsibility is to take care of them. And, you know, people want to increase their self-esteem or increase their confidence. But if we're not treating ourselves kindly, I mean, that's the ultimate of, of self-confidence, right? We And we teach people how to treat us. So if there's people showing up in your life that are disrespecting you or undermining you, the best place to look is like, where am I disrespecting me? Where am I undermining me? Because people are just mirroring back to us, you know, and that was a hard thing for me to swallow at one time because I was in a relationship that was mirroring back to me a lot of hard stuff. But I had to really look at it because it was, you know, it had a lot to do with my own self-esteem or lack of self-esteem, I should say, that kept me there. And not until I started to improve that and start to say, like, I don't deserve to be treated this way by anyone else, including myself, you know, because we some people this somebody in a group I was in yesterday was sharing how he started to listen to his inner dialogue and he heard himself saying things to himself that he wouldn't say to anyone because it was so hurtful. Right. Like, what's our self-talk? What are we are we beating ourselves up? Are we calling ourselves stupid? Are we? You know, you can change that. It takes intention. It takes practice. But take feeding yourself meals. You know, I, I was recently talking to a woman who who doesn't make time to eat. You know, she eats her kids' crumbs. It's like that's really interesting, right? If you just look at it, and and when she realized that, it made her sad because she real. You know, I just asked her, like, you know, do you do you sit down and eat a meal? Do you eat breakfast? And she realized that she stopped making herself meals and she, which is wonderful. I'm sure she's a wonderful mother, but she's not taking care of herself. So she's not modeling to her children that she's worth being respected. She's not modeling to her children that they have permission to take care of themselves, especially when they get older. Right. And she's also diminishing the quality of her life and her health. And you know, my mom died young because she didn't know how to take care of herself. And she was a wonderful, giving person, but I felt ripped off that she died so young. She didn't get to meet my daughter. She didn't, you know, and I, and not to blame her. She was the product of her circumstances, but she wasn't taught to take her own health and well-being seriously. Hmm. And I think that this is the message we want to give to everybody that when we can start to treat ourselves with more love and compassion. We're going to treat others with love and compassion. It has to start with ourselves. And it's not selfish or egotistical. It's once we fill ourselves up, then we don't need as many things. Because as you were saying before, it's yes, we it's nice to have nice things. It's nice to have a nice life. But a lot of times we're looking for love in all the wrong places, right? If we get another car, if we get a new the newest phone, if we get, you know, all of that stuff. And then we're still walking around with this void within us because we're not filling ourselves up. I've been learning a lot about law of attraction and law of vibration. I'm just interested in hearing from you. How do you bring law of attraction into the mix when you help solve some of the problems? Yeah. So, you know, law of attraction is something that is always operating. A lot of times we don't want to look at it that way, but really we do on many levels create our reality. And so if we're, say we're 40 pounds overweight, there's something going on in our beliefs, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a protection. A lot of, a lot of women have told me this is my armor. I don't feel safe without it, you know, but maybe it's, you're constantly beating yourself up. Or maybe you're telling yourself the story that I can't lose weight. So, so what we tell ourselves attracts a vibration, right? There are people that say, I can't look at food. It makes me fat. That's a vibration. That's an intention. That's an energy. And even with the food we bring into our body, right? So law of attraction is always working. Our beliefs are the foundation of what we're attracting into our life. And it's not a matter of beating yourself up because things are showing up in your life that you don't like, but it's an opportunity to explore what are the beliefs? What are the, what are the deep reasons why I'm having this problem? 
you know, because again, if it if it has to do with being overweight or underweight or or um, low self esteem or even destructive relationships, we've attracted them into our life because we have a story, we have beliefs. Again, we have a vibration that is calling it into us, right? Like I alluded before to a relationship I was in, that was it was a very um, it wasn't a, it was a very hurtful relationship to say the least. And I was in it for a number of years and I attracted it into my life because it was a reflection of my self-esteem or lack of. And I knew that changing partners wasn't gonna change the situation for me. Changing partners is what ended up happening, but I had to do the inner work to start respecting myself enough to call in a re relationship that was gonna be respectful of me. Hmm. So that's law of attraction, right? because our vibration, we're vibrational beings and we call into every aspect of our life. It's empowering when we can start to look at what is it in me that's creating this rather than being victims, right? That, okay, I'm this way because of my parents or I'm this way because of my spouse or I'm this way because of my circumstances. And yes, maybe some of us have had more challenging circumstances than others, but then you see people who had really crazy circumstances that are like winning in the world. Like look at Oprah Winfrey, right? I mean, she had a horrendous childhood and she's a successful, confident woman who gives a lot to the world, right? And there's many, many instances of that. So, and she's a, a woman who takes responsibility. She's empowered. And so taking responsibility is very empowering. And so when we start to see areas of our life that are less than what we would like, you can start to ask yourself the question, like, what's in me? What are, my, what are the stories? What are the beliefs? What's the vibration I have? And it could be as simple as when I sit down to eat a meal, what are my thoughts? Many women that have been on many diets sit down to eat food and they're feeling guilty. They're feeling ashamed. They're feeling like they shouldn't be eating it. And that's going to affect how the food goes into your body, how it affects your metabolism, how it affects. So setting an intention before a meal, honoring the food, blessing the food, being grateful for the food, looking for food that's really going to honor you rather than putting in foods that are filled with chemicals. And, you know, those are not, I'm not saying you, you can't eat those because you can set an intention and, and eat, I mean, aside from eating things like poison and crazy things. But I think that if you have the right attitude and the right vibration, these bodies are amazing. And what we think about how we're feeding ourselves, what we think about anything in our life really goes a long way. So a lot of people that I've worked with and continue to work with, I have a one program which helps my clients go really into a very deep dive where there's journal exercises and there's audios and there's videos and there's coaching with me, but it's an exploration into knowing yourself more fully and to start to uncover those limiting beliefs, those, um, those story patterns that we've inherited, maybe we're unconscious of them, becoming more conscious of them. So you can write your new story so that you can change your paradigm so that you can become the person that you want to become. So it's first unearthing all of those things that are keeping you where you are. And then it's reframing it, looking at it different. And I believe affirmations are wonderful. Um, I think using processes like tapping and mindfulness and affirmations together is very, are very powerful. Um, because sometimes we can keep affirming and keep affirming, but if we have deeper beliefs that need to be unearthed first, it can sometimes make it even worse, right? Because then we start thinking, well, this is not working. And going back to there might be something wrong with me. I think I'm not enough and there's something wrong with me is a prevalent problem in our culture to begin with. You know, I think it starts at a young age when our parents can't love us enough or be there for us enough. And then in our little minds, we make the decision, well, maybe there's something wrong with me. And then that decision, that belief carries us through life, right? And we play it out. Only if I was 
good enough or enough would mommy and daddy be able to love me and there's all different forms of that but but that's the awareness right that they did the best they could with what they had if they couldn't be there for themselves they really couldn't be there for you and so this law of attraction is is just like the air we breathe is always apparent and it's just waking up to what are the areas of my life that are showing up or the relationships in my life or the situations in my life that are showing up with um with less than what i would like and then to start to explore the hidden beliefs and and uncover that and then start writing the new story changing that becoming the person because ultimately if you want to if you want to be free of any kind of physical problem or disorder or and there's there's lots of good work around this dr joe dispenza does a lot of work around this um but you have to like i don't identify with that fat little girl anymore i mean i grew up fat i was 160 pounds by the time i was 12. and i can look at pictures and i show my grandchildren and they're sort of shocked because they've never seen me like that you know but i don't i see myself as a slim healthy vibrant woman and you have to see yourself differently to become that person because if you still and there were years when i didn't i still still saw myself as fat even though i became anorexic i still that's the, the body dysmorphia is a real thing because we're not seeing ourselves we're seeing ourselves through an old lens so it takes time it takes practice and there's definitely things that you can do to shift that but ultimately if you want any aspect of your life to change then you have to be the change. If you want more money in your life, then then what would you be doing and being that represents that? What you know, what would your attitude towards things be? If you want more, whatever. Maria, if you don't mind me asking you, I know we kind of touch on this topic, like self-sabotaging, right? Like this is a very typical behavior. I think a lot of people have encountered it, including myself, right? Like, oh, I'm not good enough. Like, I'm not sure if I can do this. And when people who are trying to change, right, they feel like, okay, I'm doing the meditation. I'm doing the tapping. I feel like I'm still not feeling good. I'm still not getting to the point where I I'm feeling good about my life. So if someone who is going through the process and they get a little bit discouraged because they are not seeing the results that they wanted, what mm -hmm. would be some of the advice that you will share with them or maybe something else that they should be, you know, considering as well? Yes, that's, that's a great question. So I think first off is that if we're pushing too hard, it's not going to it's not going to get you to where you want to go so sometimes we just you know we push too hard we're trying too hard and we're pushing we're, we're efforting we're trying to force it and make it happen and really if something is not moving again i'm going to go back that there are deeper drivers right sometimes if we find ourselves in in self-sabotaging behaviors there's usually deeper fears or something else that needs to be released and by beating yourself up and trying harder you're not creating the space to go deeper. So it starts with having compassion for yourself and curiosity rather than pushing harder. And I, I emphasize that pushing harder because I think in our Western culture, you know, if something's not working, we try harder, we push harder, we double up, we spin our gears. And I did that for years. I burnt my, I'm, a, I'm from the East Coast, I'm from New York. <laughs> like I've had, I've gone the gamut. I burnt my adrenals and you name it. And then the pushing harder was not the solution for me. It was, it was actually stepping back and, and doing less and being curious. And, and so if they're usually with self-sabotaging or sabotaging behavior, there are deeper fears. And if you're pushing harder and you're beating yourself up and you're scolding yourself, it's only gonna make you more fearful. It's like if your child is afraid because they're having difficulty doing something and now you're browbeating them and telling them you're just not doing it hard enough. It just, it's not going to solve the problem. Okay. It's not what's wrong with you. It's maybe what happened to you. Right. So let's, let's go a little deeper. So that's the first thing that I would say is that if something is not showing up in your life or you're not getting movement in one area is to step back and be curious 
And then the other thing that you touched on, Emily, is that usually the reason we want to do, be, or have anything is because we want to feel a certain way. Okay. So if we're pushing harder and we're saying, I'm not happy with my life, I'm not happy with my life, and you want happiness, then bring your attention onto what brings you happiness. Start practicing happiness because life is not a, a future event. It's right here and now. And if you continue going forward to find that happiness in your business and your relationships and your weight and whatever, it's, it's elusive. You'll never get there. But the more you can find ways, think of things that make you happy. What would make you feel happy right now? Because it's a feeling we want. Because if you go through trying to get that happiness from outside things, no amount of things is going to get it, give it to you. You might feel satisfied in the minute, but then it's like, okay, I have an iPhone 12. I need the 13 now, right? It's like, it's, it doesn't, it's not sustainable contentment and happiness. So I would say, and that's again, a law of attraction thing, right? Because if you start to cultivate and tune into the happiness, if, if you want happiness, then what makes me feel happy today? What would make me feel happy today? Maybe this morning I went for a walk and everything is in bloom and lush. I was like, this world is magnificent. Like take it in, you know, because I can easily get caught up in my day. And it's like the outs getting outside in the morning. First thing, now that the weather's getting warmer, I'm a little wimp when it comes to very cold weather. But now that it's really warm, I can, I, you in the winter, I usually do my yoga stretches first and maybe I'll go out a little after, but it was nice to just get out this morning and take in the moment, take in the nature, take in, you know, enjoying my first cup of tea in the morning. Like, how can I really find pleasure and happiness in my day-to-day -day things? And, but what we resist persists and what if we put a lot of like hard intention onto something, it becomes elusive. So I would say tune into what is it, you know, why, why do you want? I love that seven layers of why. Have you heard that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's like, well, why do you want something? And then it's like, and then you ask yourself, like, for instance, you could say, I could talk to a client and say, well, what, why do you want to lose weight? And they'll say, oh, because I want to feel better in my clothes. And then why do you want to feel better in your clothes? Well, then I feel more attractive in my body. And why do you want to feel more attractive in my body? Well, maybe I'll have more attention from my husband, you know, whatever it is, but it's like, I know for my why with my physical is like, it's, it's more about being there for my daughter and my grandchildren. Cause I told you my mother died young and I'm grateful to be able to be in their lives and, and not only to just be in their lives, but I can, you know, I can play ball with them. I can, you know, do things with them. I get on the floor with them. And so, yes, I do like to, wear nice clothes. I like to not have to worry about what's going to fit me in the morning because I had years of that. But I also, the, the big gratification is that, you know, I, I'm not stressing my daughter out about my health and that I can enjoy my grandchildren. So the quality of life. And you also feel better too, right? Like you just feel great. Like you're enjoying every moment. Um, the quality of life. I love that. And uh, I keep reminding myself on that as well, since like I'm going through this like personal change and personal development. And I think I, the other day I just wrote it on the sticky notes because after listening to Dr. Dispenza, he was talking about the importance of feeling good, feeling motivated. I immediately wrote it down on the piece of paper, like I feel love. I feel relaxed. I feel grounded. I'm enough. You know, like I feel like sometimes like I have to remind myself that like, hey, Emily, just be grateful and be happy, even though, yeah, you might have a bad day, like things happen, you know, but like at my core, you have to have a emotional home. I know Tony Robbins talk about that a lot. Like it's like by default, this is how I feel, right? Um, so I'm practicing on that and making sure I'm always going back to my emotional home. Um, That's wonderful. But you know, even when we go through difficulties in life, because sometimes things get triggered, things come up for us. Um, and being able to hold a safe space for yourself too, then because I, I'm not 
I think that happiness and gratitude are essential. I think, you know, there's a whole science of, of happiness, but I think, you know, play, putting a sticky face, a smiley face on top of our pain is not really helpful. We need to allow the pain to come up oftentimes, right? If there's some wounds that need to be healed, putting a smiley face on it is not going to heal the wound. As a matter of fact, it can lead to even more depression and even suicide. So embracing, you know, if there are challenges coming up for you, if there's difficulty, and by all means, getting support, getting help to uncover some of that. But some, some of us have been through a lot of stuff. And so, so sometimes just holding yourself through it or finding someone that'll hold you through it is, is what's needed to heal so that you can ultimately be happy and whole. And I'm not saying, you know, you, you, you want to live there, but I think that creating an environment where it's okay to feel feelings that are maybe less than happy. That's one of the things about emotional freedom techniques is it, that's wonderful when you do more um, focused work with emotional freedom techniques. Cause I teach like in my videos and when I do publicly just some stress management, but there's focused ways of applying emotional freedom techniques where you can actually go to the painful incidents and, and clear up the trauma, clear up the energy, clear up the emotions that are stuck there because our energy, our emotions are energy and they're often stuck in our body. Hmm. And um, so the tapping will get that flowing. It will activate that and it'll actually release a lot of that. But you can, that's why it's emotional freedom techniques because you can, you can actually work on moving it through. And that's the beauty of a practice like that. At, because a lot of times you think that you're upset about one thing and a, a perfect example somebody I was working with today where um, he, she thought that she was really upset about one thing and we started tapping on it and what we really uncovered because she's feeling angry and frustrated but she was really disappointed and hurt but she didn't know that she was so caught up but you know if you should you sh well, I shouldn't feel angry I should you know, she's like, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to get angry. I'm like, well, why aren't you angry about that? Like, let's get to the anger because we want to get the anger out because stuffing it down, if we don't transform it, if we don't transmute it, we transmit it. Mm -hmm. So we'll unconsciously pass it on to the next generation if we're just trying to sit on it and repress it. So it's, there's a place for all of it. And the reason it's called um, using a practice like emotional freedom techniques is that we want to give voice to the emotions and then let them flow through us rather than suppressing them. And if you're not feeling great, don't pretend that you're feeling good, right? Like be real, be authentic about how you truly feel. Uh, I think that's kind of the downfall of gratitude uh, practice. And I'm glad that you brought it up because I read so many articles online, um, people saying that gratitude practice is a joke. Like it's like a joke that doesn't really serve our true needs and true feelings. And I, I, I thought that was really interesting because like you always hear like, oh, gratitude is good. Gratitude is good. And we should do more. We should do more. But then how to do it right. That's also very yeah. important, right? You're absolutely right. That's, I agree. Gratitude, appreciation is right. But getting your, when we're in a stress response, I want to say that that's the one thing. When we're in a stress response, the body produces all kinds of chemicals and it's hard for us to be grateful for anything because the body, our physiology has been shifted. It's like we took a medicine that makes us feel worried and scared and afraid. So helping with stress, did you ever have a day where you just relaxed and you let go? It's easy to feel grateful, but it's, but, but when you're overwhelmed and you're stressed and maybe you're ruminating about something and whatever's going on, it's hard, not only hard to find it because you're in that place of stress, but the stress is actually creating a chemical that makes it nearly impossible to feel the gratitude, right? And you can say it over and over again, but you won't feel it. So the best thing to do to get to a place of gratitude is to start to de-stress your system. 
go for a walk, put some music on, dance around your living room. Again, I recommend doing some tapping, doing some stretching. Um, and that's going to actually de-stress you. And then it's easier to find gratitude because your body's now creating all of the hormones that make you more optimistic, that make you see things brighter. And it starts, I mean, for me, it's like I get up in the morning and either I'm doing some yoga prep, yoga stretches or I'm going out for a walk. Or I'm, you know, before I put on the cell phone, before I engage with anything, before I have breakfast and I just, I get myself like in order, especially like if I've had a bad dream, even, you know, the stress from that. So you want to release that and come back into your center. And then from there, you can start to activate, you know, what you feel grateful for. And that is law of attraction. When you start thinking about what you feel grateful for, it will bring more. You'll think about this and you'll think about that. De-stressing yourself can be a great help with that too. Absolutely. Or they can come find you, Maria, right? And then you can provide some professional help. So where can people ask the last question? Where can people find you on social media? Yeah, so um, I, I have an Instagram uh, account, Body Confidence Solutions. And I do have a YouTube channel, Body Confidence Solutions with Maria LaPuma. I also, um, I've been getting, I have a Facebook group right now and I've been on Facebook a few years, but I haven't been on Facebook as much. I, I check in here and there, not all that much, but I guess those two, Instagram, I've been playing with more and YouTube, I have over a hundred videos. So you can um, check out some of my videos. If you are struggling with um, emotional eating or food related things, you can certainly go to my website, bodyconfidencesolutions.com. It's one word. And you can, um, you can check out some of my resources. I have a free ebook, Three Steps to Stop Emotional Eating. Or if you want to just email me, there's a contact page there. You can email me if you have any questions or want to know anything else that I'm talking about today. So I think that those would be good resources. Amazing. Yeah. I will link them down below as well. Thank you so much, Maria. It's been a real joy staying down with you and learning all about the techniques and resources that you have shared with my audience. I'd love to have you come back sometime soon. And Meanwhile, you know, love to stay in touch and everyone leave me a comment. Let me know what you think after this episode and feel free to check out Maria's content and YouTube channel. I will definitely link them down below and dream big and make things happen. Thank you so much for tuning in. Yes, thank you for tuning in and thank you, Emily, for inviting me. It's been lovely to get to know you. And absolutely, if you ever want me to come back on, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See you guys next week. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.